But uh, it, it's great to meet you, and I'd love to begin our conversation with coming up on the fourth anniversary of the pandemic. How did you survive that time period, getting through the pandemic, and how did it change you? Yeah, it's such a good question, Joe. I, it changed me enormously, and not at all. I don't and uh, perhaps that needs a bit of an explanation, but when the pandemic hit, I immediately knew it was something quite different. And I'd already said to a couple of clients in February who had teams that were global teams constantly on airplanes, you know, in and out all the time, have a look at this, watch it, track it, but be prepared that it may be something really unusual. I, I, of course, I had no idea it would be a, a global lockdown. None of us could have known. It was, it was truly a sort of unknown, complex situation. And I think people do three things at a time of deep complexity. One, we sort of um, get into sort of frantic mode and rush around and try and sort things out. Uh, the other thing is that we almost pretend it's not going on. So it's a little bit of denial going on. And the other is to sort of watch and wait and, and really try and make sense of what's going on. And I did the latter. <laughs> and I can remember sitting on my sofa, resorting to my drug of choice, which is Hagen dazs salted caramel ice cream. Yeah. And sitting there and just thinking, this thing will start revealing itself soon. And of course, when it did, I immediately thought, well, there have got to be people who are doing stuff around the world amongst my contacts, my ex-clients and clients, that could be helpful to other people. I mean, we really were dealing with something that was completely unknown. We'd never experienced anything like this before. Uh, so I got busy and I started doing a series of interviews with um, people from across the sectors in different places in the world and how they were actually coping and what they were doing really looking for some nuggets that could help other people to uh, learn something and perhaps apply them, you know, in their own businesses, in their own careers and, and lives. So I kind of waited a little bit and then got, got busy with that. And I, I guess apart from that, probably the trickiest thing was that the, the public speaking side of my business died, the keynotes, the getting on planes, going places, and that part of my business oils the rest of my life. You know? yeah. It brings in my you know, coaching clients, the working with C-suite teams, all of that. It, it's just a lovely organic type of business. And um, that just died. And I, I love hindsight. It's probably the most um, generous of things that we could po possibly do is to look back because we find reason. And when I look back, it was the very thing that prompted me to uh, take a course in complexity, some missing pieces in my jigsaw puzzle, um, put together a masterclass around future focused leadership and write a book. So it was a catalyst for a whole bunch of other things that needed a fresh new way of looking at the world. And uh, it did exactly that. It wasn't always fun. It wasn't always easy. I'm not pretending for a minute it was any of that. But gosh, it was rich. And uh, I learned so much. Yeah, it's interesting. My only thing I was really doing at the time was jazz radio. And I branched out since then. And I really ramped up my interviews. And I found that there was a level of not feeling so alone. I think it brought comfort to everybody involved. And I just think overall, it was that time period was so unique. I mean, did you find that doing interviews during that time was a real time capsule of what we were living through? And maybe in its own way, it was cathartic. Hugely. I mean, so I'm a great believer that I need to understand something. I need to get it to give it. And um, through the process of doing those interviews, I was basically gathering data, gathering information about how people were coping the unusual things that they were doing to reach their markets, to revive their businesses. Of course, um, this idea of pivoting was sort of front of everybody's mind. How do we take what we've got and fashion it into something else? So I learned so much through every one of those um, interviews. And of course, the byproduct is it helped my community. It helped you know, the people that I know in business 
to extract something from it. I also started um, something a little bit unusual, I guess, a Time to Pivot series, which was open to the public. Um, it was a logistical nightmare on uh, Zoom. And uh, people would show up and we'd go into breakout rooms. Each person would have the time to talk about the issue that they were dealing with in their careers or their businesses or their lives. And then we'd put it out. It was, um, I guess, like collective consciousness. You know, what were the ideas in, the, in that particular group that people could come back with that might help that individual? And I'm a great believer that wisdom is to be found everywhere. And, you know, once we've exhausted our own networks, our own community, our families, our friends, um, often the best ideas come from left field, from places that we'd least expect them. And that was a really beautiful series. If I could have figured out the logistics of it all, <laughs> we would have kept going, but it just yeah. became unmanageable. And um, you know, the key thing was to deliver value to people. So, so that was also really an amazing experience, hearing people's stories and, and what they were up to. And I, I, I took so much from that. So let's get to the heart and soul of what you do for a living. I know on paper, it all seems pretty evident, but if I put you in front of a bunch of third graders at career day, and one of the kids says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? Gosh, it's, it's a, a tricky question without seeming really slick and um, unthoughtful. But I guess I would say I'd help, help people to be the best they can be. And I help businesses to um, deliver the purpose, you know, whatever their purpose is, whatever they've set out to do in the best way possible. So I don't know we, whether a third grader would understand that. But. I, probably so. I think in, in varying degrees, maybe not at the depth of where we're at, but I think they would probably get it on a visceral level. Um, what did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream to grow up and become? Oh, gosh. Uh, I was just such a curious kid. I've always been deeply curious. I mean, whatever's going, I want to figure out how it works and I want to go and visit and I want to go and check it out. So um, I was quite creative. I ended up not doing anything creative career-wise. Oh, I guess you could say that today, everything, everything I touch is creative. But I loved art and I loved making things. And I've often thought at some point, um, I'd love my own studio or even workshop <laughs> you know, to, to actually make physical things. Um, and I actually picked up a paintbrush 17 years later, once I'd finished school and painted ferociously for about a year and uh, sold quite a lot of it. So it's still there, that sort of desire to, to express it, um, you know, in, in different forms. So let's go back to where you were born and raised. How did these seeds of not only creativity, but helping people, how did that grow into who you are today? Well, I, my parents are from the UK. I, pretty much my whole heritage. And I guess my parents were kind of adventurous because they took, my father took a succumbent to Cape Town for a couple of years. He was a, a finance guy and they loved it so much they stayed and, and I was born there. So I got really lucky. I, I got to be born in Cape Town. And I grew up in South Africa, which was just an incredible childhood. Very free, very, um, I guess everybody my age would look back at their childhoods and say how oh, free it was, you know, running around like a hooligan on a bicycle or a horse or, you know, <laughs> barefoot and all of that kind of stuff. And then I started my career in London in the investment banking sector and then technology and then executive search. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wasn't that mad about investment banking sector or technology. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. It was interesting. But the most important, most interesting part of it was always people. And I was a deal maker, so lots of negotiations, trying to get warring tribes to, to come to some sort of deal. And I think when I got into executive search, I found that golden thread of people. And uh, I guess my curiosity about people has always been there, even, even from when I was a young child. You know, what makes people tick? What makes me tick? What makes you tick? You know, what's the best way of you know, finding a way forward. How can we collaborate to make stuff work? So that was always there. And then in executive search, I think that was just simply ignited. I could, I met so many thousands of people who had done the right thing. They joined the right company with the right name on the door and had progressed through their organizations. They got an MBA at the right school or, you know, degree or whatever it was. And yet they were deeply, deeply unhappy. There was something missing. 
And of course, in executive search, I was working on retainers. I didn't have a lot of time for, you know, working around the coaching side of things. But I recognized very quickly that these amazing, talented, extraordinary human beings just weren't actually going to realize, you know, their full potential as who they were as people and as business people, as, you know, husbands and wives and, you know, brothers and sisters and all of that type of thing. So that really, that got it going for me. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that time in my life. So who's been a hero for you in your life? Every single client I've ever worked with. Uh, the courage that we need to grow is extraordinary. And I guess when you're constantly working with people who are, I don't know, getting through terror barriers and taking, you know, the chance to, to do something a little different and, and the outcomes are so impactful. Uh, every single one of them, you know, are my heroes. And it, it's what, what I wake up and do every day. So as an author, what was the first book that you read when you were young that, that stuck with you, that made you want to read more or write someday? Oh my gosh. Um, my mother used to have to take me to the library twice a week because I just galloped through books. <laughs> I couldn't get <laughs> enough of it. But I remember reading a book when I was in my teens called Uhuru, and I forget the author, but it was about Kenya and the changes in, in government there and the changes in rule. And it was so profound. Um, I really felt that book. And I'd often thought of writing myself and I've you know, written all sorts of things, you know, blogs over the years and articles and pieces, but I never really thought I'd, I'd actually publish a book of my own. But I think that this constant reading, the constant delving, the constant inquiry, the constant curiosity, um, I, I think that, that that started very young. I, I can't even pinpoint a book, but it, it was definitely twice a week to the library and you know, big time consumption. I think I could, I could take up two books at a time. So yeah. that, that was the limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now that you find fascinating or intriguing, who would that be? Who would you love to meet and talk to? I would have loved to have met Stephen Hawking. Um, an extraordinary mind. Uh, I remember watching a documentary about him and um, how he transcended, you know, the, the extraordinary nature of his disease. And, and I think a lot of the things that we're seeing now in AI about sort of, thought and speech and translation and all of that kind of stuff um, started with him. But yeah, I, I would have loved to have spent just time with him, not once, but, you know, popping in and out and going back for more. Yeah. Uh, that would have been amazing. Yeah. yeah. So in, in your work that you do every day, what is it that gets you out of bed? What is it that gets you to want to accomplish and to help people and then also evolve and grow as a human? I think the two are inextricably intertwined. Yeah. You know, as my clients grow, I grow because I must. So, yeah, I've always been an early riser. Sun comes up even when, <laughs> in my 20s that I perhaps used, used to party so much more. Um, you know, it was kind of a curse. I used to think, oh my goodness, you know, I, I can't bear this sort of way of being. But today it's just brilliant. So sun comes up, I'm up, out of bed. And... For me, every day is a new day. There is, and I think also the variety. Every client is different. Every situation they're dealing with is different. Every organization is different. Every C-suite team is different. Every time I speak to an audience, it's, a, it's different. And I think that's the thing that keeps me energized and connected and curious because that's kind of the thing that runs my life. So do you have a, fi a favorite client success story? Oh, there's so many. I mean, I founded this business in London in 2005 and uh, I'll be 19 in May. So I can still say I'm a teenager for a little while longer. <laughs> there you go. But um, as the world has changed over those 18 and a half years, so too have I. I started um, working with, I took an accreditation, an ICF accreditation in conscious leadership in 2010, 2011. And that really ignited my deep connection with conscious leadership, what it means to be a conscious leader and conscious business, purpose-driven businesses. And of course, today we're starting to see that pop. You know, everything's about timing in life, Kairos rather than Kronos. 
And at the time it was, oh, that's lovely, but you know, what's in it for me kind of thing. Um, and then I got really curious. I was invited to go and take a futures and foresight course, uh, really about thinking about the future in multiple planes. And in 2017, so of course that, you know, supercharged that sort of thinking and I recognized instantly that people needed it. The organizations definitely need it, leaders definitely needed it. The world was changing. And then a complexity course and some behavioral science stuff. And so I think that this constant evolution is something, and of course the types of clients that I attract are the type, types of people who want to grow um, in this kind of way. So, you know, probably not that massively attractive to somebody who just wants to get their boss's job. <laughs> yeah. But somebody, I always think that I'm, I'm probably the coach and the facilitator and the speaker for the, the thinking person's um, career, you know, yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So of all of these things that you've accomplished and done and overcome in your life, what are you ultimately the proudest of? I think of holding love at my core. Uh, whatever I do, I do it with a deep, deep care and kindness. I mean, it doesn't mean that I always have great things to say to people. You know, often I'll say to them, you're not going to like this. Um, but there is a deep, compassion and love and care at the core of every single thing that I do. And sometimes that's difficult to hold on to in business. Um, you know, there are all sorts of pressures, all sorts of things going on. But without that, I think it's, it feels very shadow and meaningless for me personally. So I would say that that is at the core of what I do. And I'm glad that I've been able to, to nurture that. So let's say we get to the end of this call and a time machine pulls up in front of your house and you can go back in time and see one event in human history with your own eyes. What would you love to have witnessed? The Big Bang. Yeah. I would love to be the Hubble uh, telescope right now, personally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that what we're discovering about the universe is quite extraordinary. I mean, yeah. our idea of who we are and how important we are in this little blob floating around, oh, or maybe, an, I mean, to be an astronaut, I think yeah. I want to go to space before I die, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, I want to see the Earth from outer space. That would be cool. So er everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, colleagues, your readers, but you ultimately live your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Oh, goodness, that's a really interesting question. And this is therapy hour. <laughs> therapy hour, I love that. Um, yeah, deeply compassionate, deeply curious, um, optimistic. I'm also very pragmatic and down to earth. Um, and I really love what I do. I, you know, I'm not sure if it can be, I can be any more succinct than that. So if anyone wants to get your book, they want to learn more about you, hire you, anything about your world, where's the best place to go? Yeah, the book's on Amazon, and I think it's on Barnes & Noble as well. Um, or my website, which is mowbraybydesign.com. And if they want to connect, um, I'm on LinkedIn, probably the most active platform that I'm on um, as far as media, media is concerned. Um, but yeah, the website has everything from masterclasses to coaching to uh, team development, you know, the works and a link to the book as well. They want to get that. Wonderful. Louise, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your story. Best of luck with everything. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Joe.